So, let, let, yeah, let's talk uh, media headlines. What do you think of this Antonio Brown thing? So, Antonio Brown, for the person living under a rock that doesn't know, I'm just kidding. But um, basically, he's a NFL superstar, right? That in the playoff, he plays for the Buccaneers. He's a wide receiver. He has had document, documented concussions in the NFL in the past. He's played football for a while now, obviously. Um, he is a wide receiver, which is a position that, you know, is involved with a lot of high head impact injuries, right? High velocity. High velocity, right. Um, and, you know, basically in the playoffs this past year, he was playing for the Buccaneers. I don't even think it was a halftime, right? It was like middle of the game. Something happened on the sideline. I don't know exactly what. I'm not going to say that I know. I'm not going to assume that I know. But he took off his pads um, and his shirt and then just started, you know, ran to the locker room, you know, interacting with fans as he did. So basically just quit right in the middle of everything in the middle of a playoff game and what i saw a lot of on twitter as well as other sort of social media platforms was that he must have cte if he's acting like that yeah and you know if we can <laughs> superimpose the slide i created that uh, demonstrates a number of um headlines uh, they're pretty sensational you know th that that's really where it gets out of hand yeah but um yeah, the way he puts it uh, and speaks, uh, I think, somewhat rationally about um, about what he did is is that, uh, you know, he was pushed by a coach um, to play despite an ankle injury and uh, given an ultimatum. And he said, I I'm taking off this jersey because I don't want to wear this logo anymore. I, you know, you're not representing my best interests. Right. And then, uh, you know. Uh, went on to uh, take off his shoulder pads because he was just too sexy for it. <laughs> too uh, sexy for yeah, his clothes. See, too sexy for his pads. <laughs> you'll see in his <laughs> podcast interview uh, about it. But um, he then went on to say some other things that I think were pretty reasonable. You know, he said uh, on the topic of CTE, you can't diagnose that in life. And uh, uh, putting up the stats that he puts up, right. how could he have this condition? Right. I don't think he's right or wrong, I, you know, but I think he's thinking about it in a reasonable way. You know, why focus on on um, whether he's got some condition uh, because his behavior is is um, is abnormal uh, when everything else is going so right. You know, I think um, his abnormal behavior is is not that different from prior behaviors he's had. Right. Uh, although I don't follow him too well, I don't know, but it seems like he's uh, been in the headlines more than once. And um, and this could be just a personality. Right. It, it may right. be nothing more than that. And the fact that he is functioning on such a high level suggests he definitely doesn't have <laughs> dementia, right. obviously, right. Um, but um, may also be uh, a sign that that he's uh, doing just fine. Yeah. Um, so, and I'd hate to do this, but you know, Aaron Hernandez was arrested, in you know when he was an NFL superstar. And I'm not certainly not saying that this behavior is. Um, equivalent at all right but i'm saying aaron hernandez was functioning pretty well he was an nfl superstar he's just you know also killing people yeah yeah so the question i think that you're raising is are the signs of early cte early stage cte right. um so obvious and debilitating that one couldn't um uh, be functional be high performing right uh, you know, I don't. I don't think we know. I would just I be just conjecturing. Say, you yeah. know, because we don't know. Uh, you know, the real way to find out would be to, at this point, autopsy the brain progressively over a person's lifetime. But you can't do, can you? No, not ethically. And, <laughs> and um, or you know, have a, a, a diagnostic uh, biomarker like uh, Dr. McKee was saying, yeah. the Holy Grail. You know, if if we could find essence of CTE from a diagnostic scan or blood test of some sort. Um, and then track that over time and correlate that with symptoms or behaviors or something like that, we would know. And then I think, um, you know, for, for, and I mentioned it before on, on when I did the mental health uh, episode with Brandon, which was, uh, you know, hypothetically speaking, let's say it's not Antonio Brown, it's somebody, some other NFL superstar that did this, that is getting assigned the CTE diagnosis, but in fact, maybe he's having like some mental health issues. I'm not saying Antonio Brown's having mental health issues, but I'm just saying, giving a hypothetical context, right? What does everyone telling you that you have CTE, what does that do to you from, from a mental health standpoint, right? Yeah. I can only imagine what it would do to your mental health if you're getting assigned a neurodegenerative condition that you can't do anything about. 
Yeah, I mean, you just said it. So a, a progressive condition that has no treatment, um, and, and the fact of the matter is uh, it doesn't have um, any certainty around diagnosis or progression uh, or prognosis, um, is, is uh, it's doom. You know, it, it's, it's, um, it's got to be uh, devastating. But I think more than that, it's, it's restrictive uh, because it restricts the individual uh, from getting help that could be um, life-changing right. uh, and, and, and perspective that could be life-changing. And so I think that's the big deal. You know, whether, the, whether an individual has or is going to have a CTE on pathology uh, or autopsy or not is not the real question at hand. I think it's whether they have things that are affecting their behavior today that can be treated and uh, can be reversed, and um, and we can optimize brain health, so that if they were to develop a condition, or if they are developing a condition, that it uh, progresses slower or uh, is prevented. Cool. Let me put you on the hot seat real quick. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to. But um, back to the Philip Adams thing. Do you think Philip Adams' CTE diagnosis had anything to do with his mental health and his behavioral issues? Do I think his CTE caused his behavior? Do you think it had anything to do with his behavior? Yeah. You think it had something to do with his behavior? I think it's possible. You know, I think that this should raise uh, our all of our attention uh, and um, and 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 uh, all of our kind of investment in uh, more research to figure this out. I think it's a very important research question as to whether um, this this pathology found actually does cause behavioral changes like this um, and can be prevented or tracked uh, or treated. Right. Yeah, so that's another lesson learned, right? It is not only what we mentioned earlier, which is providing these people accessible resources, but then also obviously, you know, it's a, it's a hard lesson learned as to the more research and more resources that need to be poured into this, this kind of field of study. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's excellent. Um, so I also wanted to transition over to, you know, you mentioned a study before. The studies that you mentioned looking at people's football exposure. So they don't necessarily look exactly at how many concussions have you had, right? Because, you know, what we know is that, you know, it, there's no set number of concussions where if you had three concussions, you're going to get CTE. If you've had 20 concussions, you're going to get CTE. We just don't know that. There's no number set out, right? right. So what they do is they say your f footballer or contact sport, sport exposure, right? So that implies to me maybe that, you know, not necessarily are we looking at concussions causing or contributing to a CTE, but also maybe some of these sub-concussive injuries. Well, that's specifically what has been related to CT pathology is the exposure to subconcussive head blows, and um, that just means uh, when the head or body gets hit and the brain moves inside the skull, um, and there are no symptoms. Right. So Whereas the concussion is when that type of mechanical forces uh, occurs, and there are neurologic symptoms right. that occur afterwards. Yeah. So um, those occur. You know some hundreds of times a year for a uh, football player, more for different positions and uh, different types for different positions. A lineman, you know, um, has different uh, mechanical forces than a, a defensive back, for example, and different velocities of, of, of head hits. So um, that that is what's thought to uh, correlate with, with uh, STE on autopsy. That's really important, right? Because subconcussion can be anything, right? You hit your head. That's a, is that a subconcussive impact? How are you supposed to know if your I brain? I think shakes um, the, the understanding is uh, we're talking about thousands of hits. Um, from one of uh, the studies uh, quoted, I think on Concussion Legacy uh, Foundation's blog, um, there's um, head injury exposure from football of over 14.5 years is a risk factor for CTE although there are players who have played for longer who did not have CTE. Right. Um, but we're talking about uh, massive amounts of head injury exposure. We're not talking about a couple years or a concussion. Right. Well, so that's 
I mean, that's really important, right? Because that doesn't only exclusively limit this sort of really high CTE risk to, you know, football players, right, that are potentially smashing their heads together on a frequent basis. But then what about people that are, that are heading the ball regularly in soccer, for example? Are those people particularly at risk, given the fact that we're saying, okay, well, subconcussive injuries is actually the risky head injury happening over and over and over again that's leading to CTE, right? I've we have patients, right, that come in and say, I used to off-road, you know, from for like years at a time, right? And my head was going back and forth, back mm -hmm. and forth. Do I have CTE, right? I've heard about jet skiing, right? People that jet skied are now worried that potentially they have CTE because, you know, they're rattling around when they're jet skiing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the gray. Yeah, I mean, like, what, what do you think? The, the gray area this? there is, um, you know, how do you determine what is a sufficient number of and, uh, kind of intensity of subconcussive blows. And so uh, I think we don't know that yet. And it's reasonable to ask that question if later in life you're developing symptoms and had an exposure of any of those things. Um, but it's not definitive and, uh, and you know, you should seek someone to figure that out. Yeah. So what does that process actually look like to you when someone um, is coming in and they're wondering about CTE, right? So you, you said, let's make sure that there's not reversible causes. But then what are some other things that they should expect moving forward, like in their workup? Yeah, I think the, the best case scenario is, um, let's say a retired athlete from a combat sport comes in with um, some brain fog and difficulty remembering things and maybe some mood changes like anxiety. Um, and uh, they're struggling to kind of um, do their job every day. Maybe um, that's noticed by uh, their boss or what have you. And um, they're wondering if those symptoms are due to aging or CTE, and, um, and maybe this individual is 50 or 45. And so that's a great time to get into a clinic that can assess that. Um, it, I think, would be damaging to think that um, they have CTE, attributed to CTE, and not be seen by anybody. Uh, equally as damaging to be seen by someone told that you had CTE and um, and there's nothing to do about it and and uh, and neglect any of the things that could be treated and so what it would look like if they came to brain sport or any of the other uh, facilities uh, that uh, kind of are versed in, in CTE and, and neurobehavioral changes is uh, a thorough history of you know when these things started whether there was any essence of these things that occurred you know earlier or during football career or sport career that they were playing um, and and whether there was any discernible triggers to these symptoms other than the head injury exposure um, and then uh, go through um, other historical elements of medical illness and family history and so on all to build the case that there's probably a lot of factors here and then uh, we would perform kind of a simple neurologic exam, a neurocognitive exam to look at different aspects of their thinking, decision-making, memory. Um, and then uh, if there's uh, sufficient concern uh, that there might be something neurologic going on, we might get a, an MRI of the brain to look at brain structure, make some subjective judgments about uh, location of uh, atrophy or brain thinning. Um, and then... Uh, uh, we might even get some labs done uh, for reversible causes of these symptoms like vitamin B12 deficiency or other vitamin or um, other chronic kind of uh, uh, infectious causes or inflammatory conditions that could be causing similar symptoms. We might even bring in other specialists, psychiatry, psychology, neuropsychology, occupational therapy, nutrition, and then ultimately would recommend a ton of behavioral things uh, as well as potentially some um, psychiatric treatments, depending on um, the mood, anxiety, and other uh, mental health symptoms that, that occur. All of that would put the person in a much better place to optimize their current state sure. and potentially find some resolvable or reversible conditions and uh, make some headway on them while they're trying to get back to work or continue uh, doing uh, whatever it is that they're finding problems in. So that's a great start. And then we monitor them over time. We might get a PET scan if if things uh, seem to be progressive um, and uh, and look for a pattern of, of uh, uh, difference in metabolism that would be specific to uh, a known neurodegenerative condition like Alzheimer's. So lots to do, lots of monitoring. Now the PET scan, yeah. you, there's no um, specific pattern 
for PET scan abnormality in CTE. No. Right. So what you're doing with a PET scan is you're ruling out other kinds of dementias. Exactly. Okay. And then the neuropsych, the comprehensive, we have a lot of people that come to us with a comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation that's looking for any sort of dementia or any sort of co- uh, deficit in one of the cognitive domains, right? Can you just like extrapolate a little bit more on that? I think that's uh, completely reasonable if someone is, is um, not able to progress in um, daily living or their job or is having complaints about mistakes in their work, uh, is having some dysfunction in daily um, uh, and independent living. Right. And so a comprehensive neuropsych battery would kind of do multiple tests in different cognitive domains, you know, short-term memory, long-term memory, uh, working memory, uh, decision-making, uh, response time, um, processing speed, uh, visual-spatial function, all kinds of things to get at what parts of the brain are kind of working well. And um, really the comprehensive nature of it allows the uh, examiner to test with multiple tests each brain function so that uh, the individual being tested can't perform poor on one language test um, and great on all the other language tests and say, you know, you have a language problem. That one language uh, poor test was an aberrancy in testing and, and their language function otherwise is very normal. Right. And so the uh, neuropsychologist is really um, set up to figure that, uh, figure that out. Is there something that kind of on all tests batteries is, is, is not functioning well? And then we can use that data to figure out if the brain image, like an MRI, correlates with the abnormal test function and whether it's progressing over time. Right. So it's an important test to do, especially if there's a, a dysfunction in daily living. But again, let me reiterate that even that abnormality found on the comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation doesn't tell you that you have CTE. It, ha- it tells you you have a, defici- a cognitive deficit, right? right? That could be from a, from a lot of different things, right. including a dementia. Right. Right. So there's patterns that could be found that would be um, consistent with a particular neurodegenerative condition that is well known, like a frontotemporal dementia or Alzheimer's or, or another. Um, uh, but there is no pattern that right. is consistent with CT. Right. So also, I really want to bring up that, you know, with the sense, uh, I'm not going to say sensationalism again, because someone here doesn't like it when I say sensationalism. But, now, you know, the, the media headlines describing CTE, brain injury, um, neurodegeneration from brain injury, and has really, I think, brought up a lot of people and physicians and, you know, healthcare folks that, claim to be brain injury specialists, right? And claim to be able to diagnose CTE when you're alive, right? Because we have these patients that come in from all these other, you know, self-proclaimed brain injury specialists, and they say, I was diagnosed with CTE. It was like, well, how are you diagnosed with CTE? That's impossible. Did they take a piece out of your brain and look at it under the microscope? You know, obviously not. So, um, you know, I, I would, I would advise everyone to be weary of, making sure that you're going to a reputable place when you're thinking, okay, I had this repetitive head injury exposure. Let me figure something out for myself. Is the CTE? Is it not? What can I do about it? Yeah. There are good talks on a concussion legacy foundations website, um, that, that hit this topic pretty well from a couple different physicians that one is in the community, one's associated with the academic center that um, see patients and help with that diagnosis and often come into um, uh, scenarios like that. And so I think getting that diagnosis is uh, inappropriate. Probably the practitioner was was well-meaning, but at the end of the day, it's not a helpful diagnosis. It's not an accurate diagnosis that we we can perform in in life. And so therefore, uh, we can have sufficient concern that something is happening that's new and that could progress but that concern should lead us to do a more comprehensive workup and attack things we know how to help with and then uh, monitor symptoms over time. Right. That's the best way, I think, to kind of holistically care for somebody rather than giving them a diagnosis and not having anything for them. Right. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, diagnostic treatments, di- diagnostic modalities out there currently that aren't necessarily standard of care. Right. Which means you can do them, but, you know, there's not enough evidence behind them to say you definitely do have CT or you don't have CT or you have this issue after your brain injury or you have or you don't have this this issue after your brain injury. Right. Talking about diagnostic tests, diagnostic modalities. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, uh, it's a great point. There's a good NPR episode that I think you're probably thinking about yeah. about SPECT imaging that uh, occurs at um, a clinic and um, at attempts to diagnose a variety of things, but right. there's not evidence that that is capable of specifically and sensitively diagnosing those conditions. And that could be, again, detrimental, leading to um, the recommendation for therapies like supplements and um, more experimental things that don't necessarily have any, any evidence to help with that condition, right. let alone, you know, the sufficient background to ha have the diagnosis um, at the start. So, right. yeah, be wary of that uh, and um, ask multiple people. If someone's telling you yeah. they can diagnose it, if someone's telling you that there's a new treatment, that could be exciting, that could be interesting, uh, but ask for other opinions so yeah. that you can really triangulate on what's fact. Yeah. That's excellent. Is there anything else that you want to add about CTE that you think is important that we didn't cover? We covered a lot. Yeah, we did. We did. Um, I guess, you know, the last remark is that um, there's a lot we can do in life uh, to, to uh, work with cognitive and behavioral symptoms. Uh, and uh, we have to kind of maximize that before uh, giving up to a diagnosis that can't even be done in life. Yeah. Uh, but uh, on the research side of things, we need to keep doing research on this. We need to have a biomarker in life. We need to have um, multiple academic centers uh, pushing for understanding the condition better so we can um, pool across these study sites and, and uh, make a consensus. Yeah, I want to reiterate that, that hope is never lost, right? Um, and I think that there's always something that you can do to optimize your brain health, right? Yeah, and we um, didn't talk about the kind of cornerstones of brain health, but um, I think at this point it's probably obvious to most people, and it sounds pretty basic, but um, we have the most evidence behind um, these behavioral things that could improve brain health and prevent the onset of neurodegenerative conditions or at least delay. Right. And that includes um, nutritional changes, and so uh, the best – diet known for brain health is it the Mediterranean diet mm -hmm. um, and then uh, adequate sleep treatment of sleep apnea and other sleep conditions and uh, exercise on a regular basis and um, good social and emotional engagement yeah. on a regular basis those things seem rudimentary but they are kind of the building blocks of, of brain health yeah and we, we have a lot of people and I myself man I'm always looking at uh, for ways to uh, to optimize brain health, right? Because, you know, you want to function at a high level, right? And if you're sleeping six hours a night like I did last night, it's not a way to optimize brain health, Indeed. you know? Yep. So, um, you know, I think that's a great foundation to build off of, um, especially in terms of, you know, CTE or not CTE or whatever. Yeah, right. absolutely. Um, and then I also, I, I, I wanted to plug this at some point, right? We're talking about all the CTE, we're saying, Oh, you know, like if head impacts cause CTE, subconcussion, su uh, subconcussive injuries cause CTE. But I like to just at least take a few minutes to talk about the benefits of sport. Right? Um, you have a, you have a decreased risk of uh, you know cardiovascular disease if you have participated in sports. Right? right. So certainly, you know, the jury's out in terms of your risk of CTE if you play you know football, for example. But the jury isn't out in terms of the cardiovascular benefit of doing that, right? Right. That's pretty. That's that's pretty settled. I think, I think uh, more than that, the social adjustment that an adolescent or excellent point, yeah. younger individual developing uh, gets from playing team sports mm -hmm. is uh, massive. Right. And so, um, not just cardiovascularly um, and kind of in terms of uh, metabolic health, uh, but also uh, mental and social health uh, is is a critical and um, and powerful benefit that um, comes from playing team sports. Yeah. So it, it's got tons of benefits. There are some risks with every sport, uh, including physical and other injuries. And so um, that always has to be weighed. You know, the way I would approach it from a parent perspective, as far as football goes, is um, think about whether there are appropriate uh, rules and protocols in place and um, restrictions for practice and play. Uh, for practicing gameplay, you know, if a concussion occurs, is there a concussion protocol? Are there training staff uh, right. at the school? Does um, the school limit the um, the unnecessary um, head injury contact 
um, that can occur with, with certain practice routines and so on. There's lots of ways that uh, you can limit unnecessary hand impacts and still enjoy a sport like football yeah. uh, or any of the others. Yeah, um, especially combat sports. I know combat sports can be pretty violent, but you know, I myself, I, I do some boxing, and I'll admit it on air that sometimes I will spar. Um, haven't had a concussion yet, though, this year, which right. is... Have you had any sub sub concussion? I don't know. <laughs> There's no way to find out. I'll let you know. Well, have you what, been hit in the head? I'll have them. I'll, I'll have them communicate with you after they've autopsied my brain. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I've been hit in the head, but you know, I uh, haven't suffered any concussions or anything like that. So, um, and that kind of transitions me to, you know, I know you played football, right? You're a huge high, high school football guy. Um, it was a great outlet for you. Apparently you've told me before, um, and you know, I, I played a lot of, a lot of contact sports growing up too. So, you know, we're not just coming from this sort of white coat, uh, scientists. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, it's social, you know, it helps you, your, your, your social structure, but you know, also, you know, I attribute we attribute a lot of my success, yeah. my mentality. Yeah. We definitely understand that to team sports and yeah. uh, to playing football. Yeah. A lot of my best friends to date, uh, I played, you know, on the front lines, uh, with them you were in the trenches, in the trenches. Uh, it, it was uh, it was a battle and i was a center and middle linebacker so it took a fair amount i hope of, you know uh, right now we're bringing up a picture that gr that football <laughs> picture that you had up I before yeah, yeah 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 no so certainly there's benefits um you know certainly i think we're advocating for a lot of lessons that we mentioned um, you know on this episode and uh that's pretty much it do you have anything else no that's it that's it all right folks Thank you so much for joining me. Um, always a pleasure to have Dr. Kevin Picard. You're the guy, <laughs> the CT, my CTE guy. Um, please, uh, if you guys have any questions or concerns, if you're having any, any, if you had a history of head impacts and you know you're having symptoms that you're wondering about, certainly you can contact the clinic. We'll have a contact email at the bottom that you can reach out to us at. Also, you can Google us. And, you know, we'll come up probably one of the first search results. You can just reach out to us. We'd be happy to see you. You can specifically request Dr. Kevin Picard if you'd like. I'm sure we'd be willing to accommodate. Um, and then that's pretty much it. Please have a great day. Stay safe. Be well. Bye-bye. <laughs>